Welcome to the Bread of Light broadcast. We pray that today's teaching blesses you, encourages you, inspires you, and motivates you to truly live a life worthy of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that we serve. Be blessed by today's teaching. God bless. We, we, we thank and praise God for the opportunity to, to go into his word and to study to show ourselves approved unto him. And he does indeed have a word for us on uh, tonight. We're in the midst of our series on the road to redemption. And the road to redemption has many different twists and turns. And tonight we want to talk about influence. We've talked about uh, determination. We've talked about uh, being steadfast and being resolved. Tonight, we want to talk about influence and the importance of influence uh, on those around you and, and how God uses something that uh, we take for granted in a word, but if we take that word and break it out, he uses it through influence to truly make an impact in the lives of others, which is what God has called us to do in our lives as believers today. So being a, godly, being a godly influence on those around us by faith, that's what we want to talk about tonight. So as always, we, we open with a question, and the question that I would open with is, what does it take to be an effective godly influencer? That's the question. What, what does it take to be an effective godly influencer when we look at the TV or look on social media, especially, and we see individuals that hit certain numbers of people that follow them or certain numbers of people that that listen to them or that receive what it is that they say as far as their opinions or thoughts they're called in social media influencers so would it not stand a reason that we as believers we should be influencers as well and we should be godly influencers so the question is on the table what does it take to be an effective godly influence anyone i'll open that up to, to the class I think it takes, um, definitely takes knowledge, um, takes consistency, um, and um, endurance um, to keep pushing, even though things may not go the way that you want. Um, so yeah, those three things, consistency, knowledge, and endurance. Okay, amen. First lady, excellent answer, consistency, knowledge, and endurance, all of which are very important. And I agree wholeheartedly with all three of those, you know, consistency. They're, they're really interrelated. You know, having a knowledge of who God is should ideally be the motivating force to, to help us endure. But endurance implies that we have challenges coming our way. And uh, being consistent is the only way that we can overcome those, those challenges. So, so I definitely agree with you on all three of those things. I definitely agree with you on all three of those things. Uh, anyone else? Uh, what does it take to be an effective godly influence? Um, somebody that that literally um, they they walk out what they're preaching and teaching. They they the people see their fruit um, when we're trying to live like Christ and we're trying to you know be obedient and follow His command and and try to do what Jesus did. Like people need to see that we are doing it to not just get on there and preach about it and talk about it, but we being an actual example about what we're saying and what what um the Bible is preaching. Amen. That's that's right. Very, very, very true, Sister Savina. Being a doer of the word and, and not a hearer only. People would very much rather see a sermon six days a week than than hear one preached one day a week. Because what we see in society really has a much greater impact than what's said. And, and for us uh, as believers, that, that holds true. So when we look at that, and we, we talk about uh, being, being godly influencers, you know, everything that both of you said is 100% correct. Everything that both of you said fits into the faith model of being a godly influencer. And, and the question could be raised, you know, what exactly is a, a, a being a godly influence and what exactly is this faith that you're talking about and how is it going to help us that's that's really what we're going to talk about tonight and we're going to be talking about it against the backdrop of the journey 
that Christ is taking to the culmination, which is the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. We've already addressed when Christ left and set his face like Flint. We've already addressed uh, the determination dynamic that was involved uh, in the uh, in the journey that that Bartimaeus showed naturally, and that uh, Zacchaeus showed uh, spiritually with his will. Tonight, we want to look at um, these five tenets of the faith model of being a godly influencer against the backdrop of a story that a, a melding of stories, a blending together of stories that we that we all know very very well. So being a God, godly influencer, there are five basic components of being a godly influencer that, that we have to live out um, to both of your points consistently and boldly with an understanding of who God is. And we have to actually do it, not just say. Uh, the F in uh, the faith model is focusing on those around you. Um, if this is big enough for it, one of you to read, if you could, that's fine. If not, it's okay. I have no problem reading it. Okay, no problem. I can read it. F is to focus on those around you. John 11 chapter verses 41 through 44 says this. So they took away the stone and Jesus raised his eyes toward heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me and listen to me, but I have said this because of the people standing around so that they may believe that you have sent me and that you have made me your representative. When he had said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Out came the man who had been dead, his hands and feet tightly wrapped in burial cloths or linen strips and with, with a burial cloth wrapped around his face. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and release him. Now, Jesus arrived late uh, just to spark the faith of his audience here. And what he did, he did it to, to first and foremost, to spark that faith. And yes, it was to validate uh, the power that he possessed through the Father, but it was more so to spark their faith. And the first step in being a godly influencer in the faith model is to remember the F in the faith model. Focus on those around you. Part of being an influencer from a godly standpoint is to understand that what it is that we're seeking to share, what it is that we're seeking to uh, present to individuals is something that's not going to benefit us. It's something's going to benefit them. Because many times our faith, which is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, already has us in a space and a place because of our knowledge of who God is, that God is already going to do. And because we already understand and know that God's going to do it, we have to be consistent because when we get to the point of understanding and knowing that, the enemy is going to get to mess. He, he is. He's going to get to messing because he's like, okay, I got I got to stop them because if they let this faith get rooted and they keep on just doing what they need to do here, then this is going to disrupt and destroy my kingdom. And for us as believers, that's the whole idea. But what we have to remember in the battle that's going on between the, the powers of darkness and, and the, the power of light, which those of us as children of light walk in, there are a whole bunch of individuals on the side that are watching. There are a whole bunch of individuals that, that are still undecided. There are a whole bunch of individuals that can really sway this thing one way or, or the other. They, the election here for, for mayor was last night and those was a landslide very, very early in the um, coverage. They were saying, we really kind of want, want to watch because it's early in the results coming in and there are a lot of swing areas out there that depending on which way they swing, it could have a bearing on this to, to let us know whether or not it's going to be a landslide or whether or not it's going to be a long night. What am I saying? I'm saying that it's in those areas where there's, there's swing voters, if you will, those, those areas where there are people that that uh, haven't made their minds up about Christ that that are still available to be won. And that's what was happening here. I'm sure you all you both recognize that that this passage of Scripture is out of the uh, discourse in the word about Lazarus and with La when Lazarus was raised from the dead. If we look at this in relation to the road to redemption. When Jesus left, he wanted to go through Samaria after he set his face like Flint to go towards Jerusalem, but Samaria and the Samaritans wouldn't let him come through. So we talked about this last week. He took the long way, ultimately the way he's going about taking the long way that gave Jesus an opportunity to run into Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, who, because he was passing by, their determination 
gave them both a revelation of who God was. And as God continued to pass through, he stopped in both of those situations and restored sight naturally for Bartimaeus, which activated even more his spiritual sight and validated Zacchaeus' his spiritual sight because he took the initiative to position himself to receive from God. It left uh, an impression in them and noise began to follow. People began to follow. And in following, Jesus continued on because his face never stopped being set towards his destiny. And for us as believers, once our face is set towards our destiny and God is ordering our steps, he begins to use us in ways so that as he uses us and people are blessed, they begin to speak on the things that God is doing. And in the process, God is taking us into bigger things to be a bigger blessing. So that's what happened here. God brought Jesus to the point where he got word that Lazarus was sick and Jesus purposely slowed down, purposely took his time to get there because he understood in the faith model of being a godly influencer, that his time was short. And he understood that he could have went there and did all this for the fame to give himself glory. But what he wanted to do was give God glory and in the process, put the individuals that were there in a position where they had to trust and believe God and they had to know that only God could do this. They had tried every natural method that they might have known to try to save Lazarus's life. They had tried everything in the natural that they knew to do and nothing worked. And Lazarus, Lazarus had died and Lazarus, Jesus made sure Lazarus was good and dead because by the time he got there, he had been gone four days. And even when they talked to Jesus before, we got to this point in the scripture about uh, rolling the stone away. When Jesus said, rolled away, they said, uh, the Master, as I paraphrase, he's been gone four days. By now, it's probably smelling pretty bad in there because they didn't have the, the uh, embalming capacity that we have now. Jesus said, that's okay, roll the stone away. And what God desires us to do in our walk is we should be in a constant state of encouraging everybody that we meet to roll the stones in their lives away from things that they've sealed away, things that they buried, things that they thought that were dead, dreams that they thought that were dead, relationships and opportunities that they thought that were dead, not for our glory, and but for God's glory and for their benefit. Because like Jesus said in the King James Version, it says in this portion here that for the benefit of those that are standing around, Father, this is for their benefit. None of this and none of this and none of what God calls us to do in ministry and in the work that he's given us to do with the gifts and talents he's blessed us with, none of it is designed to give ourselves glory. All of it is designed to give God glory. And in the process of giving God glory, what it does is it blesses others. It's for the benefit of those that are in the undecided category. It's for the benefit of those that are still trying to decide if I really want to do this. It's for the benefit of those that may know Christ, but they're, they're wavering in their faith. It's, it's for the benefit of those that may have known him at one point in time, but for whatever reason, they fell away. Maybe it was a disappointment. Uh, maybe first lady, to your point, that they, they got sick of being consistent because they didn't see any growth. And they said, well, the heck with it, what's the point? Um, Sister Tavina, to your point, maybe they just gave God real good lip service. But when it came down to, to offering real service, they weren't ready to do it. But they somehow, some way, they never gave up on God. God wants us to continue to be in a constant state of focusing on those around us because Jesus focused on everybody else other than himself. He understood that his function and his role was to be a blessing. His role was to serve and not be served. If anyone deserved to be served, Christ did. But Jesus came because he knew that his job was to serve. And he knew that his service was service that was going to pay eternal dividends. Amen. So uh, anybody have any questions or any comments or anything they'd like to add or share? Okay. Amen. I, is, what, is what I'm saying making sense? Does it make sense? Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. So God needs us to, to, to stay focused on those around us because that's what influences do. But the thing that's different between the world's influences and godly influences is that the world's influences are doing it for self and the world's influences are doing it for selfish gain. They're doing it so that ultimately everything comes to them. 
But if we look at the A in the faith model, being a godly influencer, it's telling us to ask God to open doors. Now you notice it says open doors, not close them. Because what influencers ultimately do, they ultimately in the natural. And when I say in the natural, in the natural meaning that they're doing this thing to please self. They ultimately are doing things that ultimately have all roads and all answers lead back to them. Everything is all about them. It's all about their way. It's all about their belief because the desired response for an influencer is for people to buy into and believe what it is that they're selling. So as they buy into what it is that they're selling, that gives them more power. But because we are ambassadors for Christ, because we're ambassadors for Christ and we're seeking to do this thing God's way, God desires us to ask him to open doors so that he can use us to be a greater blessing to even more people because it's not about us, it's about God. And what it says here on this page is that if we look at John the 12th chapter verses 12 through 13, we take and we look at another snapshot in this journey. And we're looking now at the next day, literally the next day, because Lazarus rose, he came forth, he came out, I'm paraphrasing, they, they set a table for me, sat down to eat, but they closed. So now we're at the next day. And it says here, beginning with verse 12 in John chapter 12, the next day, when the large crowd who had come to the Passover feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and homage to him as king and went out to meet him. And they began shouting and kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed or celebrated or praised is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, in, in this section here, and it says on the slide literally this, the large crowd that met Jesus with palms and hands were proclaiming so much more than their momentary pleasure with Christ's arrival. And it's significant to understand what it is that you're saying. Because the word Hosanna is so much more than just a word that we say, like, We've heard it said oftentimes, which is true, that the only word in the Bible that translates exactly the same, no matter what language you translate it, is hallelujah. That that's the same, no matter what language you seek to translate it in, it translates exactly the same. And hallelujah means let us praise Yah or let us praise God. And that that's a universal tenet, that no matter where you are, no matter what language you speak, no matter what part of the globe you live in, you know, God is saying, we need to pray. You need to praise me. And we're saying, let us praise Yah. So when we look at Hosanna, Hosanna is a word that literally means uh, uh, save us now. It literally means save us now. So in that instant, in that instant when they saw Jesus come, I'm sure the word had, had, had gotten there by, by, by people just sharing it. I'm sure people had ran ahead. You know, some of the people that were there uh, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in excitement, took off running and probably had already run into Jerusalem and already started spreading the word. Hey, Jesus is coming. Let me tell you what he did. Jesus is coming. Let me tell you what happened. Jesus is coming. What's going on over here? He's on his way here. He's on his way here. Because remember, Jesus said his face like Flint because he was going to Jerusalem because he knew that the Passover season was coming. But above and beyond that, he knew that his hour was coming. And because he knew that his hour was coming and his face was set on doing the work of ministry that God had given him to given him to do, he understood that everything he did in every step of the way of this journey was designed to be a blessing to others and designed to be a legacy for the kingdom because he knew that he was on his way to his destiny. And each and every one of us that have professed the name of Christ have to have that same mindset to really appreciate the magnitude of how much God desires to use us. So when we see what happened here, we see Christ coming down the road and we see that the people were so excited because of the signs and wonders and miracles that they were saying, save us now. We know that you're the, the, the deliverer. Save us now. We know that you're the Messiah. Save us now. We know that you're the Christ. And it's such a, a, a blessing for people to see and understand it. But we have to take it with a grain of salt because I remember when I was much younger, a, a preacher came and, and preached at the church said, you got to be careful. Those that they're shocked because same ones that that that, that say uh, uh, Hosanna on, on, on Sunday are the same ones that may say crucify you on Friday. 
And it's critical for us to understand that because we have to be in a constant state of asking God to open doors for us so that he can keep us in the mindset to continue to put others ahead of ourselves. Not everybody that, just like the word says, tells, tells us not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to find themselves in the kingdom. Not everybody that's shouting Hosanna and praising and when you come by in that instant where God is using you is, is really on God's side, much less your side. But what happens is that sometimes we'll allow the uh, accolades of other people to get us deterred from doing what it is that God has called us to do. But here what God wants us to do is remember that our help truly comes from him. The help that we need does not come from people's cheers. The help that we need doesn't come from people accepting us because it's not even ourselves that we're presenting. It's God that we're presenting. And if we truly present God right to those people that are truly against God, they're going to hate God and they're going to hate everything that's associated with God, which is even us. That's why when we go back and look at the Beatitudes, Jesus said at the end of them, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. In other words, he's saying, they going to not like you, but you rejoice because they don't like you because they don't like me. Because there's something so much bigger than just you going on. But when we ask God to open those doors, what God can do is in the midst of that onslaught, God can step in and God can open doors and open up ways and open up avenues for us to reach those individuals, for his message to reach them through our presence. It's not about us and all God is doing is using us as vessels to deliver the gift. And what we got to be is vessels that are willing to ask God, God, open doors that are locked, open doors that no one's been able to get through before, open doors that people have struggled to get through, but the, the struggle has been too great. Open doors for your glory, because it's not about me. I just decide to be used by you. And as I activate my faith, my substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, I'm doing it thanking you and praising you that, God, you're going to provide the strength. You're going to provide the consistency. You're going to provide the perseverance. You're going to provide the fruit necessary to reach those individuals that everybody else has given up on. Because God, my work and my job is to leave a legacy in the earth for the kingdom. And I know that I'm moving towards my destiny, oh God. I don't know how many steps that, that I have left. None of us know how many steps we have left, but we're all moving towards our destiny in God. And like Christ, God desires us to leave a legacy. And the greatest legacy that we can leave, to your point, Sister Tavina, is fruit. People that, that, that know Christ, people that desire to know Christ, people that know Christ that are now going out and winning more souls for the kingdom, because that's how the kingdom advances. Does anybody have any comments or anything they'd like to share or add? Okay. So, so God needs us to be mindful that he is up to something big in each of us. And because he's up to something big in each of us, every day is an opportunity for us to give God a chance to make an entrance. Because every day that we get up and pray, God, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I pray none of me and all of you. I pray that you have your way completely. I pray that you continue to move and continue to bless. Lord, I, I pray that you continue to position yourself in such a way so that what I'm doing is an investment into kingdom business. It's an investment into a divine future, not for me, but more so for my brothers and sisters that are meeting you. Because every now and then in the midst of the journey, there's um, an aside. And what I mean by an aside is, in every story, there's always like uh, a pause where you got to tell a quick backstory to make the story relevant. And in this journey of becoming a godly influencer, God uses the sides a lot to keep to bring back to our remembrance the importance of what it is that we do in witnessing and serving the Lord so that we in turn can remind others just how 
important God is in the midst of their living. So if we look here at Matthew 21, verses one through three, it says here, when they approached Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples ahead, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And here's the payoff, verse three. If anyone says anything to you, you should say, the Lord needs them. King James Version says, the Lord has needed them. And without delay, the owner will send them with you. Why do I pull that passage of scripture? I pull that passage because when you look at all four gospels, this is one of the few passages that you find in all four gospels. And when I was looking at the main passage that we're looking at, which is in John, which is the most intimate approach, which is why we're looking at it, because what we're talking about is a heart thing. This is rooted in God's love. And when I looked at my study time, the Lord had me do a quick aside to gain an understanding about the value of investment in preparation, the value in being, in being ready to be used by God, because you never know when that moment is going to come. So as an aside, God took me to Matthew, and he took me to Matthew to gain more insight on what happened to set everything up for that moment in John chapter 12 to happen. See, Jesus didn't have a chance to prepare for the moment at hand. Jesus didn't have the luxury of having a, a travel agent to go ahead. He didn't have the luxury of having someone with a cell phone pick up, um, pick up the cell phone and call somebody uh, in uh, Jerusalem, right outside of Jerusalem, and say, you know what, I need you to have a, a, a donkey ready for me. He couldn't call Hertz and, and, and have a donkey rented. It wasn't ready. There was no reservation made. But because Christ was all-knowing, and I need you to catch this, because he was all-knowing, he knew who he could call upon to have ready what it was that he needed. Because since God is all-knowing, he knew that the individuals that owned that donkey, had owned that coat, had already prepared themselves to respond, not to the man's directive, but to respond to God's mandate. The Lord has need of it. Because they understood and knew who God was. They understood and knew the significance of who Christ was. They understood and knew the magnitude of the miracles that were being done, not because of the fact that they're being done, but they understood it against the backdrop of having a relationship with God and understanding the laws and the prophets. And as we continue to strive to build and grow our relationship, to grow a deeper relationship with God, to grow a stronger bond with God, to grow a, a deeper love for Christ, to, to grow in the knowledge and wisdom of him and in doing his will. What happens is we spend that time in prayer and we spend that time in study and we spend that time in fellowship with other believers and we're consistent in doing it and we're persistent in doing it and, and our knowledge levels grow. We begin to have fruit beginning to, to develop all around us. We begin, we're beginning to have fruit as we witness to other people and we have fruit as we encourage other people and we have fruit as we sow seeds into other people. And, and what happens is that as God is using us to do those things, he knows when he can call upon us. Because since we understand him and since we know his voice, because the word says that my sheep know my voice and the strangers will not follow. A whole bunch of people are gonna come and say a whole bunch of stuff. But when it registers in our spirit, man, and our spirit identifies with the Holy Spirit in Christ that's speaking in that instant, we'll understand and know, okay, this is God. The Lord has need of me right now. He has need of me saying this word. He has need of me releasing this word in this season. He has need of me sowing this seed in this season. He has need of me going into this region in this season. He has need of me laying hands in this season because I understand that the word says that I can lay hands on the sick and they recover, that I can tread on serpents and scorpions and, and, and nothing will happen to me, that I can drink deadly things if need be and no harm will come to me, that I can be in a position where when it looks like the odds are stacked completely against me, that victory is mine because God for me is more than the whole world against me because who can stand against God? No one. So what God needs us to, to understand in the midst of our journey is that we've got to be ready and we've got to be available to be used by God. We've got to be ready and be available to be used by him today. 
We got to be ready and be available to be used by him to bless other people. Because God still has need of men and women that are completely sold out for him. God still has need for men and women that are truly willing to live out. God, for you I'll live and for you I'll die. God is still in need of men and women that are more concerned with making him look good than making themselves look good. Because ministry is about helping people. Ministry is not about helping ourselves. Because as God uses us to help people, God uses other people to help us. Because that's how God set it up. No individual is an island. God desires us to be a blessing to one another. And as we grow in being a blessing to one another, what God then does is he gives us even greater insight and even greater clarity so that we have an even, even greater witness as we go into doing the work of ministry. See, when these asides come along, these asides come along to help us gain insight on what it is that we're doing and on the why behind what it is that we're doing. God wants us to understand the reason why I have you doing what you're doing. The reason why the interest that you're making is so profound. The reason why you're having this type of impact is not because of anything that you can do. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about me. The only thing that has to do with you is the willingness that you continue to display in allowing me to be me, God says, in your life and allowing me to use you because you're staying prepared, because you're staying ready, because you're staying filled, because you're staying equipped, because you're staying anointed, because you're staying in position to move and to go where I send you, God says. Anybody have any questions or any thoughts that they'd like to share here? Amen. So God is growing us in the midst of the process. And it is a process. And the thing about a process is that it moves forward. And for each of us, it can move forward at different paces. And for each of us, it can move forward in different ways and it might call us to do different things. And the key thing that we've got to remember in going through all of these things is that God's desire is to use us as we walk by faith. We've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's the T here. We got to be willing to take a step of faith every day with God. And it says here in verse 17 of John 12, so the people who were with him, and this is continuing in the uh, Palm Sunday narrative. So the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to tell others about him. And it's so important, continued to tell others about him. They didn't do it just once. They kept on doing it. And that, that speaks to uh, your point, Sister Zvina, having, having the fruit making sure that there's a whole bunch of fruit, making sure there's a lot of fruit around. Because fruit is something that uh, if, if you're health conscious, you can eat a whole lot of it and it's not going to hurt you. But if a person eats a whole lot of it, that means there's got to be a whole lot more so that it can be replenished as people eat it. So what happened was, is that those that, that witnessed what, what Jesus had done for Lazarus uh, the day before, those that witnessed it were, were really moved to, to walk by faith. They were moved to walk by faith and really keep on telling because it wasn't about what they had seen. It's about what they believe. And they believed that who Christ was. They believed it because firsthand, they, they, got a, they got a glimpse of what God could do. Firsthand, they got a glimpse at faith and power on display and at work respectively. And when faith and power meet, miracles take place. And they were going into a, they were going into hostile territory. You got to understand, they were in Jerusalem now. They were in the capital now. They were in a place where they didn't, not only did they not believe what it was that Jesus was saying, but they were actually conspiring to find a way to get rid of Jesus, to get him to stop saying. It. And if individuals conspired against Christ, we have to be mindful that people will conspire 
against us. And sometimes the conspiring that happens against us and the conspiring that happens can form just like a cloud, can form like a, like a storm cloud. I was watching the news earlier today and they were talking about tornadoes in Georgia. They're talking about how the tornadoes are coming and how, how before the tornadoes, you hear the sound. We've all heard it. The sound, it sounds like a freight train. And all of a sudden, you see stuff moving. And then out of nowhere, you see this happening. You see that happening. And, 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 and when, it, when you hear it coming, all you can do is get prepared. And the best that you try to get prepared, it doesn't always prepare you. And what God needs us to understand is that in walking by faith, that's the only thing that prepares us because faith is based on our belief system. It's not based on our natural senses. It's based on our belief system. It's based on something that's rooted on the inside. It's based on something that's linked on the inside. It's based on something that, that has nothing to do with what we can see, what we can smell, what we can taste, what we can touch. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It's based on the fact that we believe that God is who he says he is, that God can do what he says he can do, that God is exactly who the word says that he is, and that he'll continue to move in the exact way that the word says that he'll continue to move. So in doing that and in seeing what happened, the believers that were there, when Jesus came, the believers that were there even more so cried out even louder. They said, yeah, I'm a, yes, this is what I'm talking about. You see here, this is what's happening. What you see out here, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, what you see out here is nothing compared to what we saw yesterday. What we saw yesterday was we told that story. You don't think for a minute that that didn't put some of those people on the blacklist or on the hit list for the religious leaders of the day? You don't think for a minute that that didn't upset the church of that day? That upset a whole lot of stuff. Because what it did was it forced individuals, which is the H in our journey of being a godly influencer. What it did is it is it served as a way to help other people move from walking in fear or that false evidence that appears real to walking in the freedom that comes with walking by faith. Because verse 18 said in John, the 12th chapter, for this reason, this reason being those in verse 17 that went out there and proclaimed the good news, for this reason, the crowd went to meet him because they heard that he had performed these miraculous things. What happened was with people that didn't know Christ, that people that when people were, that were on the fence about Christ uh, made the decision to to go check out Christ and, and and see what's happening, and they did as the word says they tasted and saw that God indeed was good. It had it began to have an impact in their life, and it began to to break the scales off of their eyes, and it began to break them out of the religion that so many have fallen into and usher them into a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we do this thing God's way, this is the payoff in becoming a godly influencer using the faith model. Because we have proven, tried and tested by people watching us that it's not about us, but it's about God. Because we truly put the needs of others ahead of our own. It's truly not about us, but instead it's about God because we truly activated everything uh, all around us and we've asked God to open doors. We, we, we've let them people see that because we've asked God to open doors, we've allowed God to, to enter in. And because God has, has, has entered in, we've invited God into the situation and God is moving and God is making a difference in people's lives. And, and as he's doing that, what it's doing is that it's, it's prompting those that saw to truly walk by faith and, and not be worried about anything that happened. They're standing on the word. You know, I'm doing this thing for God. What can man do to me? Man can't do anything to me because now that I'm truly liberated and I understand who God is, even if death comes, it's okay. Because to be absent from the body, guess what? I'm present with the Lord. I don't have to dialogue through prayer and dialogue through seeking because I'm in his presence. And in his presence, there's truly fullness of joy. That doesn't mean that I don't have joy here because the joy that I have here, I'm finding in serving him. Because in serving him, what it's doing is this helping other people move out of that fear into the freedom of serving him just like me. Which means it's giving, giving God more praise, which is giving God more desire to do even greater works here in the earth. 
And in doing greater works in the earth has given us even more opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus and win more souls for the kingdom. So this faith model of being a godly influencer is really the key that God wants us to use long after the road to redemption that we're studying has ended from a study standpoint, because the road never ends, because there are always individuals that don't know Christ. And God desires us to truly be the living witnesses that he's called us to be, to be a blessing to others. Because in becoming those living witnesses, that ultimately should be the motivating factor in doing what it is that we do. Because being a living witness opens a door for other people's eyes and ears and hearts of understanding to be enlightened. So, they, the, so that they might come into the same knowledge that we've come into. That's how Jesus is glorified and that's how the kingdom grows. So I have a question. Now that we've taken a look at the faith model in becoming godly influencers, the question is this, what areas in the faith model do you find to be the areas that you're most comfortable in and the areas that you feel you need to work in the most? Because each of us are in different places, but the thing that we that, that that's a blessing is that we're working towards perfection. So that's the question I want to pose to the class. What do you feel is your strongest aspect of the faith, faith model? And what do you feel is your uh, aspect that you, you need to work on the most to, to grow it? What do you mean by faith model? The, the things that we just talked about. The, the, these different things we just talked about, focusing on those around you, asking God to open doors, investing in preparation, taking a step of faith with God, helping somebody move from fear to freedom. Those things and, and practicing all five of those things are, are what makes us effective godly influencers. So what aspect of that is, is something that you're good at? What aspect of that are you continuing to see God to continue to grow you in? Like, for instance, for me, um, for me, when I look at it, focusing on those around me is something that I, I feel I'm pretty strong at. But the thing that I have to continue to work on is uh, taking that step of faith because I'm good at taking steps of faith to a degree. But when it gets to the point where the step that I'm taking is much higher, or much longer than I've ever taken before, I might hesitate a little bit. Doesn't mean I'm not going to take it. But I might hesitate a little bit. So my prayer is that, Lord, take that hesitation away. Because I know if you've kept me to get me from there to there, and from there to there, and from there to here, you'll keep me from here to wherever you're taking me because you've not failed me yet. That, that's what I mean. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And if you, you don't know, right? Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, can you show the, the list of them all together? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. There you go. Yeah. That's actually the last slide. Um, so yeah, being, being a god, godly influencer involves each of these steps. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, this is how we as a body grow. And as we continue to pray for one another and encourage one another, we all grow. Um, I'll say mine is um, invest in preparation. I am a, a very, um, uh, what's it called it? I procrastinate like crazy. Like it'd be like God have to like put it in my spirit and told me and then when it told somebody else to confirm it for me to move. So mm -hmm. my comfort, my my procrastination, I definitely have to work on that. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. That's very fair. That's very fair. I would say mine is uh help someone move from fear to freedom. Okay. Only because of my own personality that is not as um outgoing and also because sometimes I struggle with fear for myself mm -hmm. so in order to be able to to help someone with fear I, I will have to be able to conquer that myself so I think that will be that will be the area that I would need some improvement in amen amen and that's fair that's fair and this is and and, and the blessing of it is that God has given us 
the opportunity to, to study and the opportunity to lift one another up in prayer. And, and my hope and my prayer and my desire is that as we continue to grow in the word and as we continue to grow along the journey, that in the process, we pray with and for one another so that we can be a blessing to one another so that together we all can be a greater blessing to the body because that's what being a living witness is all about. Amen. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community activism and outreach, and practical ministry designed to meet needs, bless hearts, save souls, and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed into the good works and good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life giving way. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com, or by phone at area code 404-955-8846. Again, that's area code 404-955. 8846. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.